My name is Shadi Shanach. I work as a program coordinator with the Heinrich Bell Foundation office in Prague. And I'm here to introduce to you the keynote speech of Professor Walter Russell Mead. Unfortunately, um, as you might have read in the program, <coughs> Professor Mead at the last moment had to cancel his trip to Prague due to personal reasons. And uh, therefore, we are very sad that we cannot introduce you, Professor Mead, in person, and we can't engage in interactive discussion with him. Uh, but Professor Mead prepared uh, a short video message or keynote speech in the form of a video. It has uh, about 20 minutes. And since uh, we still will have time after the video message, uh, before lunch starts, um, after the video, Mr. Jan Ruzicka, sitting in the middle of the panel, will so, sort of attempt to uh, initiate a debate, a commentary, so the floor will be open to you to comment on what you will just heard from Professor Mead. And hopefully we will have some um, interesting discussion among ourselves and then we can uh, proceed with lunch. Uh, let me just in few words introduce uh, Professor Walter Russell Mead. Um, professor Mead is a James Clark Chase Professor of Foreign Affairs and Humanities at Bard College. <coughs> and he's also Professor of American Foreign Policy at Yale University. And in addition, he's an editor at large of the American Interest magazine. Um, if we are ready, technically, I would. Uh, well, hello. Sorry. Okay, it's already here. So no more words from me, and enjoy the, the speech. Thank you. Good. All right. Well, hello, everybody. I'm sorry I can't be with you in Prague today, but. On the other hand, I suppose we can say that we've all reduced our group carbon footprint a little bit by doing this through technology. Um, I've been asked to talk about the situation that we see today in the world and how we're seeing a kind of a return to geopolitics. And that's that may sound like a little bit of a strange idea, but at the end of the Cold War in 1990, a lot of us believe that history, as they say, had, had come to an end. That is to say that the, the old-fashioned ideological competition between communism and capitalism, fascism and liberal democracy and so on, that this had come to an end. And that in the brave new post-Cold War world, we would simply be working to build the foundations of a liberal international order that all the major powers accepted. Now, to some degree, there is some truth in that. It's not a completely false idea. And it is certainly true that at the end of the Cold War, the Western countries, Germany and, and the European Union, the United States, also, of course, Japan and others, worked to deepen the forms of international cooperation, international law that we had worked together with during, during the Cold War and ever since the 1940s. But what I think we have seen in the last five years is we've seen a, a recurrence of a different kind of competition. We're seeing countries like Russia, like China, like Iran, that are not, as George W. Bush might have said, an empire of evil or anything of the sort, but who do have different visions about the way the world should work institutionally, politically, but also actually think that the world's boundaries and the world's power arrangements need to change. After all, the post-1990 settlement around the world wasn't just an ideological settlement, the fall of communism. It was also a political settlement, a geopolitical settlement. The Soviet Union collapsed and independent republics were set up in its former territories. Very soon after, the same thing happened in Yugoslavia. So there's a geopolitical dimension as well as an ideological and legal 
dimension to the changes in the world system that happened in 1990. President Putin has never made a secret of his opposition to the changes in the world's maps in 1990. He's called the collapse of the Soviet Union the greatest tragedy of the 20th century, and he's made very clear from the beginning that if he could have his way, he would restore a Russian zone of control that was coextensive with the old Soviet Union. Putin's Russia is not the only country that wants to change boundaries uh, or change the distribution of power in major world regions. We see China, which insists on something called the Nine Dash Line, where China in defiance, really, of the international law that normally governs maritime boundaries, is claiming a vast swath of sea and territory that's also claimed by countries like Vietnam, the Philippines, Indonesia, and, of course, in the north. <coughs> there's the territorial dispute between Japan and China over small islands. Um, and in the Middle East, what we've seen is that Iran uh, did not like the settlement really that came after the first Gulf War where the United States and its Sunni allies like Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, and of course Israel and Turkey, a NATO ally, were jointly the leading powers of that region. The Sunni countries in alliance with the United States plus Israel were the dominant powers of the Middle East. The Iranians have sought to challenge that order uh, first after the fall of Saddam Hussein as Iranian influence began to grow in Shia Iraq, but the, also in Syria where the Iranians have been the leading supporters of President Assad and Hezbollah. You're seeing an effort to build what some are calling the Shia Crescent, a crescent of Shia controlled territory that would go from Lebanon, southern Lebanon, all the way around through Syria and Iraq to Iran. This would be a big change in the way that the Middle East works and countries as dissimilar in outlook and ideology as Turkey, Saudi Arabia and Israel all see a basic threat to their own security and power if the Iranians are able to accomplish this. In Europe we have in some ways the most complex of these challenges to the post-1990 world system. Uh, President Putin resents the expansion of NATO into uh, Central Europe, former Warsaw Pact countries most of all. He resents the expansion of NATO to include the three Baltic republics, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, that were once part of the Soviet Union. But President Putin also, I think, sees himself in a, in a contest um, with the European Union, led by Germany, over who is going to determine the future of Europe and what will Russia's place be in the new Europe. Uh, the kind of Europe that the European Union, led by Germany and to some degree France, but increasingly Germany, um, has been trying to create a law-based European Union that grows ever closer, that includes the monetary union, that includes a harmonization of legal methods that looks forward to a greater and greater degree of political, economic, and social unity among the members of the Union. The Russians see this as a threat. Uh, they see it as a threat for two reasons. One is that it takes Russia out of center stage in Europe. It sort of pushes Russia toward the periphery. If, if Europe is going to be a, a law-based entity centered in Brussels, uh, and Russia is excluded from membership in the European Union, and certainly for the foreseeable future it is, and also Europe is to be defended by the NATO alliance, another organization from which Russia is excluded, then Russians feel that this consolidation of the Western project in, in Europe condemns Russia to the periphery, and in particular, 
because it's not simply that we're saying, all right, in the, in the European Union, there's no place to Russia, but we're pushing out the zone of the West. We're saying that, by the way, that also includes the Baltic Republics, former Soviet territory, but it also includes Georgia, it includes Ukraine. And here I think we see uh, where Putin and, and Europe really first came to, to blows. Putin interpreted Western attempts to bring Ukraine into an association agreement with the European Union as something that would set up customs barriers potentially between Ukraine and Russia and that would ultimately make it impossible for Putin to reestablish a, a, a Eurasian Union, as he calls it, that would incorporate the former members, member states of the Soviet Union in an economic and political union that would be centered in Moscow. Uh, this for Putin is a direct challenge to his political position at home. And it's, it's, a, it's a challenge in two ways. The first is that if Ukraine were to move toward NATO, if Ukraine were to move away from Russia, from the standpoint of Russian nationalists, this would be a, a terrible blow to Russian pride, Russian security, Russian identity. Uh, Kiev, as many people know, is the, is the center classically of what ultimately became Russian civilization. Uh, Ukraine has been a part of the Russian Empire for most of the last 300 years. Um, the loss of Ukraine for most Russian nationalists is a disaster of epic proportions. It's a, it's a dismemberment. It, would make, it makes the French rage at the loss of Alsace-Lorraine in 1870 look mild and petty. Um, and while Putin himself might rise above this kind of nationalist passion, the reality is that even though Putin's Russia is by no means a normal democratic state, Putin does need public support to stay in power. And the loss of his prestige and his credentials among Russian nationalists that would follow a decisive Russian defeat in Ukraine is more than I think he thinks he can bear. So already we see that for Putin, the direction of Ukraine is a question of Putin's own survival. Beyond that, um, uh, there is the the question of political development. If Ukraine succeeds in gradually becoming more like a Western democratic law-based state like Poland, like Germany, like France, this is also a blow uh, to Putin's power in Russia. Putin's argument, why does Russia need Putin? Why does Russia need uh, something a different path of development, a different form of government from the rest of Europe it rests on the idea that well you know this these modern ideas that the Germans, the Czechs, the Italians, and so on work with that may work very well and in for the Europeans, the West Europeans, they have a different history, a different civilization, but we orthodox Slavs, we Russians, we have a different path, we have our own nature. And we have to find our own way into the future. Uh, if it, when Poland began to move toward the West and, and build a very successful post-communist transitional society, Russians were able to say, like Putin, well, you know, they've always been Catholic, they've always been Western-looking, Poles are different, Czechs are different. But if in Ukraine, modern law-based liberal democracy begins to work, the economy gets better, public institutions get better, corruption diminishes, the rule of law is strengthened. This is a much more direct challenge to Putin's power at home. People in Russia, in Moscow, will start thinking, why can't we have our own Maidan Square here in Moscow? Why do we have to sit on the fringes of Europe, ruled by, by thugs and kleptocrats and dictators, while people in Kiev, in, in Ukraine, are becoming, are joining 
Europe and becoming a normal European state. So Putin cannot allow Ukraine to succeed. He needs for Ukraine to fail. And I'm afraid we've seen him act in ways that make its failure more likely. His invasion of Ukraine was not, I think, intended as a step toward the conquest of all of Ukraine. I don't think President Putin wants the whole Ukraine. He can't afford Ukraine. As it is, the West has to subsidize Ukraine and, in essence, pay Ukraine's Gazprom bill. Uh, Putin doesn't want to pay that bill. Putin doesn't want responsibility for all of Ukraine. But what he does want is for Ukraine to fail. He wants Ukraine to be distracted by an eternal war or frozen conflict on its frontiers. He wants the economic strains and disasters that comes with having for Ukraine to have a large defense budget, maintain a, a large mo uh, mobilization of soldiers on its eastern frontiers. He wants to see the social and political tension grow in Ukraine. Anything to prevent the successful reform and development of Ukraine. So, what do we do? How do we respond to that? I think it's easy for us to look at Europe and perhaps, until, maybe until recently, we overestimated uh, Europe's success and stability. In the last, last few years, we've seen first with the Euro crisis, with the Ukraine crisis, with the migration crisis, Europe has come under more stress in the last five years than we've seen really at any time, perhaps since the, the formation of the European community. Uh, and in many ways, Europe's institutions, Europe's political leaders have managed to develop some creative responses to these unprecedented challenges. But I don't think it's uh, I, I don't think it's anti-European or cynical to say that we're also seeing a greater tension within the European Union. We're seeing tension over Russia policy. We're seeing tension over migration policy, and we're certainly seeing tension over economic policy. Putin standing outside the European Union and looking at it, I think, with cold and unloving eyes. Um, Sees, a, sees perhaps a, a German project that Germany cannot sustain. That is that Germany has the German vision, and I think he sees it as a German vision rather than as a common European vision because I think Putin tends to discount the value of international institutions and organizations. He's kind of an old-fashioned thinker who thinks primarily in terms of nation-states. And he sees that Germany has an economic agenda that involves the fundamental transformation of the political economies of Greece, Italy, Spain, France. A fundamental transformation that I think we can all see is not, is not popular in those countries and may not even be practical. Um, and that Germany doesn't have the resources and or the will to provide the economic support that could really ease the, the transition. In the same way, we've seen great difficulties in Bulgaria, Romania, perhaps some other countries at integrating European norms of law, uh, cleaning up the judicial system, uh, increasing transparency in government, and also at generating the kind of rapid economic development that would allow living standards to rise and we see as well the the crisis in Hungary where uh, we've we've heard a European leader talk about the advantages of quote illiberal democracy so the European project from Putin's perspective is under under threat um, I don't think Putin has a positive agenda in the sense that he has a, an alternative vision of Europe he seeks to impose on Brussels, on Berlin, on the rest of Europe. 
but I do think he um, he intends to do everything he can to block the consolidation of the sort of Europe that people in the West have been trying to build. And if we look at, at, at the way his policy has been working, his policy seems to have uh, been centered on sort of three avenues or, or three acquiring three positions of power which allow him to threaten, to challenge, or to, to disrupt Europe's development. Obviously, we've seen for many years his energy policy, where he is working very hard to cement a position as a necessary supplier of oil and gas to the European Union, and he's had some successes and some failures in that regard, but the politics of pipelines, the politics of oil and gas deals have been very much a part of Russia's approach to Europe. The second thing, obviously, that we've seen is the um, growing security tension in the east of Europe. Ukraine is certainly one part of this. The Georgia war was another part of this. And for those of you who may not follow it that closely, in fact, even to this day, Russian troops continue from time to time to move their lines forward in Georgia, creating threats, particularly to pipeline routes and other things. We see overflights, the arrest of the officer from the Baltic states, um, increasing signs of Russian presence, and there is also the civil war in Ukraine, which clearly wouldn't be happening if it weren't for continued Russian support. And with these provocations, these threats, these actions on, on the eastern borders of, of the European Union space, Putin is able to control the international temperature. He can create a crisis, he can solve a crisis whenever he likes. The third newest front that we've seen open is in Syria, where again the civil war in Syria, uh, the civil war in Syria and fundamentally the, uh, the Assad regime's effort to crush all opposition has created the largest flow of displaced persons since the Second World War. It's created a migrant, uh, a migration of desperate refugees and others that has uh, tested Europe's mettle again as nothing has perhaps since the 1940s. And Putin is now moving as quickly as he can to ensure that there can be no settlement in Syria without Russia. So the Russian approach to Europe seems to be to position itself in a way that Europe can't meet its basic needs without coming to terms with Putin, can't control the refugee flow, can't bring peace to the eastern portions of the European Union and adjacent states, uh, and can't assure its energy flows without Russia. Um, this is geopolitics. This is zero sum. He's not looking for a win-win solution where each side gains something. Uh, Putin is seeking to achieve a position where he can have a much greater share in the discussion over where Europe goes. And unfortunately, many of the values on which Putin's system in Germany are built are contrary to the law-based democratic norms, uh, civil enlightenment that characterizes European Union life today. That I think is a quick overview of what is perhaps a, a less than encouraging world situation. We should, however, remind ourselves that the European Union is much richer than Putin, that its ideals are, uh, have, a, have a global reach in a way that Putin's Russian nationalism simply doesn't, that even with the gains that he's made in recent years on the geopolitical level, the fall in oil prices and the effect of Western sanctions have actually undermined Putin's economy. 
So I think it would be wrong to, to, to try to describe this as Putin is winning everywhere and Europe is failing everywhere, but it would also be wrong to say Putin is in retreat everywhere and Europe is moving forward everywhere. We actually do, I think, have a difficult and dangerous situation. Certainly the delegates at this conference have a great deal to discuss. Thank you for paying attention. Again, I'm sorry I can't be there with you in person, but I do appreciate this opportunity to share some thoughts with some of my friends and colleagues in Europe. Thank you very much. Okay, good uh, afternoon. My name is Jan Ruzicka and I was drafted in at the last second to start a discussion. I believe we've got uh, about half an hour or so, maybe less, for reactions. Uh, and I was asked to kickstart with a few quick comments. I think there are three that stand out to me. Uh, I'm sure you all have your own thoughts on the analysis that the present uh, situation is somewhat particular. I think there might be a question to ask whether this is a little bit of a presentist thesis. In other words, we look around, the world seems to fall apart, and uh, we think that this is something uh, new or at the very least something a little bit more dire than we've seen in the past. And perhaps that is the case, and there was a powerful analysis in the talk, but it's certainly something that ought to be discussed. Uh, I am perhaps not as convinced about that, but uh, I'm sure the views on this will differ. The other point, the second one that I would like to raise is, is the opening premise that uh, there are countries which want to ch challenge the current global order. And perhaps it is so, but we have yet to see some kind of coherent ideas. And I thought the talk as it was moving actually shifted in this direction. I think there were words at some point used that Russia, at least the case that was being talked about the most, doesn't have a coherent universalist idea. Now, if there is no coherent universalist idea, how does one talk about a challenge to the current global order? It's probably even more so visible in the case of China. I don't think Iran is on par with these two countries, but that's clearly a point that I think ought to be discussed. And lastly, there was a question in the talk that was talked, which is of course the old what is to be done question. And uh, I'm not sure that there was a clear answer, but perhaps people would have their own ideas. Now, if this is really a return of uh, geopolitics, then are we in a world where we need classical forms of accommodation, or do we need to think about this differently than in classical terms? Now, I would like to invite everybody to uh, react to the talk, uh, maybe post other questions that come out of it, comment on other elements of it. Uh, we've got about 25 minutes or 20 minutes or so. If you could please identify yourself, your, yourself before you speak up. Okay, thank you. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Juraj Laida. I am from the Universal Peace Federation. This was a perfect analysis of the situation and uh, as you mentioned, there was not so much what to do. This is the question. <laughs> Maybe in our discussion we could talk about this point, whether we should come back to the time of Cold War or people are world, or whether, what, what are some prospects, what we could do. Thank you. Yes, please, here in front row. Yeah, thank you. Ivo Kaplana, Union of European Federalists. Uh, uh, for sure, we can agree with everything what was uh, said by uh, uh, Mr. Professor, uh, if there is some objection, then <laughs> please uh, tell. Uh, so, uh, we have absolute perfect analysis. Uh, uh, practically, uh, we should stress that uh, without European Union, uh, we are now in absolute collapse in Europe. Uh, that is, that is, <laughs> that is uh, for sure uh, also 100%. Uh, uh, but. Uh, 
in within uh, the European Union, for sure, there are many tensions because the, the cultural life and traditions of uh, many nations inside are are very different. And uh, we have Ottomanic, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, Serbia. We have uh, this Central Europe. Uh, where we like not to have borders, but uh, when uh, we feel from everything, from anything uh, very small, like 1,000 uh, refugees, uh, we are we fear of 1,000 people. So uh, it's 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 tremendous. We can we can uh, hear these uh, American uh, jeeps uh, going around, and uh, and we can watch uh, one week without any without any uh, strict. Uh, uh, speech of some uh, high politician uh, that uh, this is dangerous uh, for us that we, that uh, some uh, 12 jeeps will go through uh, uh, the Czech Republic uh, and uh, this is this is this case is so so I think that the biggest dangers for all Europeans are people like uh, here in the Czech Republic and in other states uh, from the post-communist state, they they have uh, no tradition of political education. If we see uh, Germany after the Second World War, the first was not only uh, economic uh, uh, renovation, but the political building. Each party should have uh, the youngsters, the people from streets, and, uh, and they, they did political building. In uh, 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 when was that Schumann's uh, declaration, 1950, that in, uh, immediately Europa Houses was there to explain why Konrad Adenauer wants uh, this uh, uh, Europa Gemeinschaft. Uh, the same was on the French side. From this case, it's much more marriages maybe like was in Czechoslovakia between Czechs and Slovaks uh, was uh, between French uh, uh, also a little bit Swiss and Germans that's why we don't have any problem with the European Union in the south of Germany because there are many people who are really also personally personally engaged in uh, Franco-German uh, in Franco-German dualism and there is a question, why, when we have debate maybe more than 10 years already about this uh, Franco-German political unity, why we didn't see any step, any real step towards that. Why uh, the, the SI policy it was even, uh, I suppose, uh, one of uh, one of points of Amsterdam Treaty, which was uh, under signed 1997 that the asylum policy in the uh, European Union should be one, should be single by the end of 2004. So the uh, European Union is sometimes like the Czech Republic, that we had this, uh, this uh, uh, law for officials in 2002 valid, but uh, it's uh, inefficient in 2015. And I think this is this, that, that we are not following the way we already paved uh, ahead. That is a difference between Anglo-Saxon uh, <laughs> way of politics and between uh, this uh, European continent way of, of politics. And that uh, I am not uh, curious uh, that, uh, that people here in the Czech Republic uh, without any political building, without any experience with democracy, uh, because already these people who lived in the uh, First Republic uh, are dead and they cannot uh, even explain to, to, to young people today. Uh, so they, they are so in confusion and they don't know what is really going on in Brussels. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm sure if Professor Mead were here, he would have been pleased. There were two people who said that this was a perfect analysis. Now, I find it hard to believe that everybody in the room agreed. So perhaps there might be critical voices or people who would like to question anything or add to what is to be done. Now, we heard a position. Oh, okay. Right here, please. Um. 
Actually, uh, I agree if you, that, would, that if, you, if you would identify. Uh, Sir Gutkin, uh, I, I agree uh, that that was uh, an interesting analysis. Uh, uh, there are uh, two points I have uh, problems with, uh, and um, uh, one comment that I wanted to make. Um, actually, uh, well, even three problems. Uh, first, uh, when you look at uh, Russian policies, uh, uh, under magnifying glass, uh, you tend to ignore uh, the rest of what happened and what's happening around. And uh, this makes you think that uh, this is actually the uh, principal thing happening. Uh, well, uh, I think if we look at uh, uh, the global world, we'll see the rise of Asia, which is uh, poorly understood and uh, often ignored by many people, which may in uh, a longer run uh, play a more significant role than any policies of Putin. Um, but if we get to the policies of Putin, uh, the um, statement that uh, uh, Putin had to gather the support of the Russian nationalists and that determined uh, his uh, uh, political moves. Uh, I find it um, uh, kind of uh, superficial. It's, um, uh, you, you can find people in Russia who think this way uh, uh, as well. Uh, uh, the, the only thing which is important to underline that in this case we don't speak about the ethnic nationalism and uh, I prefer to use the term uh, um, conservatives or revisionists but anyway we understand what kind of mood we are speaking about. Uh, but the thing is uh, that the uh, president uh, uh, for good or for worse uh, indeed keeps a high level of uh, the popularity and uh, if we imagine that he um, did nothing on Ukraine I don't think he would uh, get in a big trouble in terms of uh, his internal popularity. So it was not that much that he needed to get support of a certain group of the Russian population, it was much more about his own convictions. And uh, we do have um, um, parts of uh, uh, Putin's speeches of different time, including, uh, well, 20 years ago from 1994, when he was speaking about all those issues of uh, uh, the uh, importance of uh, millions of Russians who happened to stay outside uh, the borders of Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union, that we sort of cannot ignore this issue. Uh, so this was uh, important for him, not because of uh, the necessity to keep uh, uh, the public support. It was just important for him because of how he sees the world. Um, and uh, obviously he had a choice of uh, how, to, how to react to the processes that uh, happened in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, the, the, the last thing I, uh, uh, I have a problem with uh, in uh, the speech of uh, Walter Russell, uh, Russell Mead uh, is uh, this idea that travels uh, from one speech to another, many, many people uh, use it, uh, um, uh, the idea that uh, Russia uh, was or is afraid of uh, uh, the uh, successful Ukraine. Um, you know, um, I uh, do care about what, what's happening in Ukraine and uh, personally I uh, wish uh, the country success and uh, I understand that uh, Russia made its uh, life very difficult in many ways. But uh, the thing is uh, that even with, if we imagine a world where Russia would just stay uh, on the sidelines, uh, the success in terms of uh, showing um, economic growth, uh, showing the uh, ability to establish the rule of law, uh, was so far away for Ukraine. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, still the poorest economy in Europe. Uh, it's uh, uh, still a country with great problems in governance. Even uh, with uh, the new people coming to power, these problems are not fixed. Uh, so uh, there was not really uh, a reason to be afraid of uh, having Ukraine as a success story. It was, uh, well, decades 
decades away from uh, being a success story. Uh, what uh, is uh, uh, probably on the Putin's mind uh, in, in case of his Ukrainian policies is more this uh, picture that Walter Russell, Russell Mead also talked about, a picture of uh, spheres of influence. And when you uh, think of the world of, uh, in terms of spheres of influence, you don't think of it in a developmental perspective. You don't think about success or failure. You think about what you control and what you don't control. The, uh, the area that you control uh, might well be success, might well be failure, but what you care about uh, is that you control it. Uh, and uh, here, the, the, the last point, uh, um, uh, we speak about the geopolitics, which is certainly on the mind of Putin, but people uh, sometimes tend to be um, hypnotized by, uh, by, by, by the geopolitical discourse. Uh, so those who uh, are not fond of Russian decision-making, who, who, who uh, criticize uh, Putin, uh, they still tend to think uh, of the world in geopolitical terms and when they address the issue of uh, European integration, association agreement, uh, uh, the Eurasian Union, uh, they start to see the world in the same terms of spheres of influence. They uh, don't dig into the details of the association agreement, how it would work, uh, they don't try to analyze it critical, in a critical way. They think that the association agreement is kind of uh, uh, a guarantee against the enlargement of uh, the Russian sphere of influence and that brings you into the same paradigm, geopolitical paradigm and the problem is not uh, on which side of, uh, or, 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 or of the fence in this paradigm you are. The problem is that you are using this paradigm and you uh, keep thinking in uh, terms which originated uh, a couple of centuries ago and uh, which uh, we would probably like to uh, live in the past. So if we uh, are really determined to leave um, uh, this, uh, uh, the, the, this old uh, world view in the past, we need to think in a different way. We uh, need to uh, try not to be just part of one of the camps, uh, but to uh, think what uh, is uh, uh, helping us to uh, develop, what is helping us to uh, build the rule of law, to build the working democracy, and this is uh, very often uh, not the uh, international mechanisms. It's not the association agreement, it's not the European integration, it's not the Eurasian integration, it's uh, something about yourself, it's something about uh, what uh, work you actually perform on a day-to-day basis in your system of governance, your national system of governance, uh, and this is the, the job which is now, very often uh, uh, sent to the sidelines when people are consumed by the geopolitical debate. Thank you very much for uh, that analysis. Uh, I think we've got time for one or two more comments to conclude. Is there... Oh, yes, please. Oh, maybe we take them together. So there is gentleman there and then there is uh, Mr. Kozan in the back. Or... Oh, he's just you. So it will be just you. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm from the Dutch Embassy and I would like to have a couple comments because in the past I've done research on the economic sanctions imposed by Russia, uh, by the EU on Russia. So I just want to address one point that I've been noticing in this panel is that there is kind of a consensus that people think that Europe has a lot of weaknesses, experience in crisis, um, and of course this is true, but I want to make sure that um, there's a difference between the EU and Russia here, because EU crises are a lot of times also in uh, a consequence of policy failures. And obviously that's a big problem, but policy failures can be addressed. The difference is that uh, Russia's problems are more structural. Russia has a very negative democratic, uh, demographic outlook, has a huge overdependence on commodities. Uh, we've seen with the recent collapse of oil prices that Russia's economy has shrunk in a deep recession. And with the economic sanctions, for instance, we've seen that uh, Europe actually has a powerful weapon by using financial sanctions because uh, the European, uh, the Russia economy is very dependent on European capital markets. So, obviously in the short term there's a lot of problems and uh, the EU 
has to address these, but in the long term, Russia has very many uh, structural weaknesses, which I think we should therefore have a bit more of a positive outlook on Europe's situation. And the current crisis, for instance, in Ukraine and, and uh, Putin's uh, foreign policy is a response to the fact that the Russia economy is no longer growing, his support figures were in decline, he's being threatened by nationalist hawks. Um, so by starting the Ukraine crisis, he's trying to cover this up, he's boosting his uh, figures at uh, his domestic support, but in the long term, I think Russia's outlook is uh, quite negative and we should be maybe a little bit more optimistic about Europe's outlook because it's just a matter often of addressing these policy failures and these are not underlying structural weaknesses. Thank you very much. It's good to hear three cheers for Europe and a powerful analysis. I think there is one last speaker there and then we are on to lunch. So. I mean, I have a question for our European colleagues, especially prompted by our Dutch colleagues' comments. First of all, it is debatable that Europe's failures are only policy failures, but let's put that aside. And let's also accept that Putin behaves exactly because of the reasons cited by either by Walter Russell or by him. What does Europe think of doing with Russia? You can't decipher the damn place. You can't oppose it militarily. What is your project in terms of finding a modus vivendi with a Russia that is supposed to be so debilitated that it is dangerous? Do you, as the Americans, try to bring them on their knees, which is what Malta Russell Mead actually suggests, I think, or do you play to something about the Russian desire, as I see it, to be relevant. We, one may not like the style, but then again, this is not a beauty contest or a popularity contest. This is serious politics. Can you really, in Europe, deal with the, with the world order, dismissing a Russia that historically is, whether one likes it or not, uh, a mediator between in, in the Eurasian continent? Do you want them to be on the Chinese side and become even more reliant on China? Or do you want them to be on the European side? Does anybody think about how to bring Russia to the European side as opposed to letting them drift towards the Asian side because of their weaknesses, if, this is, if these are going to be the terms one actually puts the questions in? Okay, a set of questions, uh, which I'm sure people will discuss over the lunch. Uh, I am not sure exactly what the arrangement is, but if somebody from the organizing team could tell everybody what they should do, I believe there is a lunch break now, and so we'll leave it there and everybody knows where to go. I get the message from Mr. Kojan, and thanks to the organizers for arranging for the video presentation by Walter Russell. Okay. Thank you very much.